and it's spinning for a second and okay I think we're live so hi everyone and welcome to the YouTube live so sorry we're late we had um, or I had some technical difficulties I had to uninstall and reinstall of my zoom app so so sorry about that uh, that you know we kept you waiting for a bit but I'm super excited to introduce Jenna Rainey and Julie Turkle uh, Jenna Rainey is an amazing watercolor artist and she's uh, been licensed with Target and Staples and she's going to talk to us today about how to get your art into retail stores and Julie is her agent who's worked at Nickelodeon and has had an amazing career as well so um if you guys just want to introduce yourselves a little bit more and tell everyone you know a little bit about your career and how you got to where you are and I guess Jenna we'll start with you sure so I'm Jenna I um started my career or my art business kind of accidentally about nine and a half years ago I started just kind of doodling on the side while I was working an office job that I absolutely hated. And it was very therapeutic for me. And art has kind of always weaved itself throughout my life, um, kind of as like a hobby. And my mom paints with acrylic. And so art supplies were kind of always around the house. And I kind of attribute my um, lack of intimidation around art supplies to just my mom and always having paintbrushes and paper and canvas around the house that we just, you know, played with all the time. And so, um, yeah, about a decade ago, I started just kind of exploring doodling a little bit more. I got into calligraphy. I started posting my work on Instagram around then. Um, and that was, you know, a decade ago was when people weren't really using the platform the way it is now, the monster that it is now with like posting uh, business type stuff or just having a ton of competition in the creative sphere. It was like my competition was my friends' uh, photos of their dogs. So it wasn't really <laughs> like it was a noisy platform like it is today. So anyway, I started posting my artwork and um, friends started buying my prints off of my Etsy shop. And then uh, soon after that, I was able to quit my job at the office because I was getting hired to design custom wedding stationery. So I did that about for about five years. I was de designing and figuring out design programs and printing processes and all of that as I was going. Um, but I did that for about five years, the first five years of my business. And then um, around 2017, I think it was, is uh, when I started getting, um, I got my first license opportunity, licensing opportunity. A yoga towel company reached out to me and asked what I would charge um, for designing three different prints for their yoga towels. And I had no idea what to charge. That's like the ultimate question as a creative business owner, what, what to charge and pricing and all of that. And so I reached out to my friend, Dabney Lee, who is one of Julie's clients. Um, she's a very talented designer. And I'd met her in New York when I was out there, um, teaching a watercolor and calligraphy workshop at her shop in Dumbo that she no longer has, but she had a shop in Dumbo um, and we met and I knew that she had like a lot of products and whatnot in stores. So I was like, this kind of feels similar. I don't know what licensing is. This feels like it's the same thing. So I'm going to reach out to Dabney. So I reached out to Dabney, asked her what she would charge. And obviously she directed me to Julie and we started working together since then. I've been, you know, licensing my work, getting my work in stores. We just had a collection launch in Staples last year, which was in the height of the pandemic. So that's a little awkward timing wise. <laughs> people, aren't <laughs> yeah. really, people aren't really making plans. So launching a planner collection is a little bit tricky in 2020, <laughs> but um, launched that, launched with Casetify, a bunch of uh, phone cases, have a few launches coming up that are amazing. And then also have done a bunch of like baby products. Um, Toki mats is one of them and little sleepies, PJs. And working with Julie has been a game changer for me because I don't have to think about the ultimate question of what to price things. So she gives me her feedback. She negotiates with the brand that we're working with and whatnot. So that's kind of how the business started. And now I teach people with Julie too, how to license their artwork and start a creative business. So there's my spiel. Amazing. Yeah. Julie, tell us a little bit more about uh, your background and how you came to meeting Jenna. Sure. Um, so I'm Julie Turkel and I'm a brand licensing agent. I'm in New York City and I've had my own licensing agency that really caters to established designer brands, media personalities, artists. Um, 
I started it 20 years ago. I came before that I was at Nickelodeon and other kind of entertainment licensing brands, which really are the key drivers of the, you know, behemoth of the licensing industry. And so I really learned like this very old school and just, yeah, just the craft of licensing through what I would call the Harvard education of licensing from some of the biggest players in the business. But my passion has on a personal level always been like fashion and design. And I, you know, knew I didn't want to be in the corporate world. I think even though I'm the business person in the partnership, I think I'm like, kind of like a want to be creative myself. And so I just could, didn't see myself going up in the, you know, in the corporate world. And I really just in this very naive fashion, um, decided after September 11th here in New York City, when everybody was doing soul searching, that I was going to go, um, I was going to approach designers that I admired who may be struggling or may may not have the funds to become a lifestyle brand. And I was going to be the person to show them how to do it. And I had, you know, I just was like sitting around in my apartment, looking around, I was collecting all of this pottery from Jonathan Adler. And this was 20 years ago when he had a store in Soho and, you know, a few other like catalog and so forth. And I just thought to myself, this is the brand I want to work with. I want Jonathan Adler sheets. I want Jonathan Adler furniture. I want Jonathan Adler table. Like I just wanted everything. And I thought this, you know, he can own modern design. Like I just had all these ideas and, um, and I went to his store in Soho and I had a business card that I had printed up and I handed it to the person behind the register and it was Jonathan. And, you know, one conversation later, I got him a contract. I brought in a business partner who to help me kind of like set up the business and run it for a number of years before we split up. But that was how my agency was born just off this idea that the knowledge that I got from the corporate world could be applied in the creative and design world. And it was like, there are art license, there are many art licensing agents out there and there are many brand licensing agents out there. But um, I think at the time they were looking at each other as being very separate. And I wanted to be the one to represent all of the, um, you know, the big designers that were going to be, you know, emerging on the scene and, um, and so, yeah, so I got, so I, you know, I've been in business for 20 years. I've worked with some big names, Jonathan Adler. I worked with Nate Berkus. Um, that was my second big designer client. And I got that just from watching Oprah and reaching out. So, you know, a big proponent of just like that cold call situation and then cut to 20 years later, I've been, you know, now working with I, Jenna, uh, she described how we met through Dabney Lee. I've had, I've been working with a designer named Dabney Lee for over 10 years now and, you know, took her from, you know, having a stationary of customized stationary line and a shop in Dumbo to being in Target, Walmart, Sam's Club, Macy's, Home Goods, you know, she's all over the place and, you know, kind of like not a household name in the business, but somebody with a vast library of prints and um, very commercial and just kind of cool to look at and makes everybody happy and smile and it just sells really well. And so you don't have to be, you know, a superstar, you know, you don't have to be on television. It certainly helps, but it helps with Jenna to be on social media, but um, you know uh, yeah, I mean, so for me, I have kind of flip-flopped in, in what I would call some, almost like an opposite direction of like working with these household names to working with names that still have a lot of um, recognition and potential, but maybe are a little bit more niche and building that up through licensing. So that's my spiel. <laughs> I love that so much. And I have to tell you that when I first got into textile design, I was working in-house, but I was super inspired by Jonathan Adler. So it's such a small world. They had um, a store here in Midtown Atlanta. So yeah, I went in there all the time and was just like obsessed. So yeah, that's yeah. really fun. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So for those who might be watching, who might be like a little bit confused about what art licensing is, um, because it's not something that I think we're really taught about if you go to art school or design school. I don't know. I, I went to um, an art school and got kind of a traditional like studio art degree. Um, and I had no freaking clue what art licensing was or that it was a possibility until, you know, after years of working, um, that's kind of how I found out what it was. And then um, I know a lot of artists too that, you know, maybe dabble in licensing, but it's not really enough to be like their sole source of income. And so if you could talk about first, like what is art licensing to begin with and how to actually make it profitable for you, um, you know, as a designer working independently. Yeah, sure. So, you know, art licensing is kind of the underlying legal mechanism behind a lot of designers creating work for third parties. So a license an art licensing is basically an agreement between um, you know, the creator, the brand owner, the designer, the artist, and a company that wants to utilize the work that they create on, in most cases, we're talking about a product. Um, so you see a lot of art licensing in wall decor, you see a lot of art licensing in home, um, you see a lot of art licensing in um, stationary, um, but it can run the gamut. It can, you know, it can run the gamut to a lot of different products. And it's basically, you know, it's pretty fluid in terms of the kind of terms that you can have with your partner. So, um, but typically it, it functions almost like a lease. You're giving somebody the right to use the work for a period of time in a certain way, in a certain territory, um, in exchange for compensation. That's art licensing. And, you know, it, it can be, the kind of licensing that I do is art licensing where your brand is also part of the license. Typically it's part of the license. It's on the packaging. It's, you know, on a shelf in the store, you're promoting it. Um, but, you know, art licensing can also be when your when your brand name is not on the package and it could be a product in the store under somebody else's brand, but you've actually created the work and given that brand and given that manufacturer the right to use it. Sometimes it could be for a number of years. Sometimes it could be worldwide in perpetuity, irrevocable, blah, 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 that language that you often see in, in probably in work for higher contracts. Um, and that's really what it is. Um, how do you get from a point where you're, you know, dabbling in it to the point where you, you are really making it uh, your business? It could be maybe even your core business. I think it's definitely a long term, doesn't tend to happen overnight. Um, even when I started working with Jonathan Adler and that was 20 years ago, he'd already been in business for over 10 years, I think like 13 years before I started working with him. So it's not an overnight success story, but you can, you know, there are steps that you can take to build it. Actually, Jenna and I have a course called brand plus brand, which kind of takes you inside the process that I go through with my clients and um, how, and, and all the steps that you need to take to build a big licensing program. But, you know, sometimes it's, a, it can be, um, you know, you can't really distill it down to a formula, but oftentimes it's a combination of really, um, being able to carefully define your work and your style and developing a lot of art in your library, and then finding the best platform to promote your work so that you can attract partners and people will see it. Um, th that's typically how it's done. Great. What I found, um, just to interject really quick, yeah. sorry, but Go what ahead. I found like most attractive to me and starting to work with Julie, and obviously I'm still constantly learning about the huge world of licensing. Um, but as artists, like we get, I feel like a lot of people get kind of trapped in this, oh, I have to open an Etsy shop or create prints of my artwork or stationery or work with clients. And while that can absolutely be a successful core business, and it was for me for a really long time, um, I was starting to get really tired of working for other people and having my work be art directed by other people, my clients, mm -hmm. and then thought, oh, I can make some side money, side hustle money if I open a shop with prints in it. And then you're in charge of all the production and all the printing, the shipping and the inventory, where, whereas with licensing, I'm just basically providing the prints, providing the artwork while somebody else handles the production, handles getting into stores if that's what the end goal is. And it's just so nice. 
<laughs> yeah. I love watching um, studio vlogs on YouTube, but I feel like a lot of artists are selling their own prints and doing the inventory and all of that. And it just looks exhausting. <laughs> Yeah, it can be. It really can be. And it's a big reason why a lot of artists, you know, I think it's not a bad idea if you are are really clear about what kind of products you want to put your work on and you can find a source and a way to kind of make it work. I'm not opposed. In fact, and oftentimes I'm a fan, somebody going out and doing that and building a brand off of that because you do need to find a platform, a place where people are going to see your work. So whether it is getting on Etsy or whether it is starting a wholesale line and going to some of the trade shows and showing your work or, you know, whatnot in making, if you are inclined to make that investment and have the appetite for it and have the resources to do it, it's not a bad way. You know, that that's how I found Dabney Lee. She had a stationary line and it was custom stationary, but she had, you know, she was exhibiting at trade shows and I was walking the trade show and it happened to be that I was walking the trade show at the same time as a manufacturer that sells product at Target was. And we noticed the booth, both of us, different places. At the, we were the same place, different, totally different people. And it just, you know, we both kind of discovered her there and I went you know, I, I decided, I decided I want to represent her. Then blue sky came along and decided they wanted to license her and pitch it to target. So it's not a bad idea to, if you, again, if you have the resources and the appetite to start manufacturing products, but I will say that once you do find your first licensing opportunity and you see how much of the pain it alleviates for designers, you'll, you'll want to replicate that formula over and over and over again in other aspects of your, you know, you, you will suddenly realize that you didn't want to expand into all these categories yourself. You want to license those categories as well. So it's when it works, it's really a genius business model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds so true. And I don't know. Um, I've tried to sell, yeah, I've, I've had an Etsy shop and done all that. And it, it does seem like, you know, sometimes you're just shipping more than you're able to design mm -hmm. when you are doing all of that work yourself as well. So licensing kind of, yeah, like you said, uh, gets rid of the logistics of it. You just get to focus on the art. So that's really nice. Yeah. Um, so my next question is how do you get your foot in the door with the big retail brands like Staples, Target? I know you kind of just touched on that a bit, but um, do you recommend like showing at it some kind of trade show? Look, you know, you guys, uh, you know, you work with Julie, Jenna, and so that, you know, and having an agent is another route, but how would you say that you kind of got your foot in the door with some of these big box retailers? So um, Julie has a lot to say on this topic. She's pitch queen. <laughs> Um, and every, I'll just say that it's different for everyone. Like everyone has every designer, every brand owner has a different strength to play up for me. When I met Julie, I had a strong social media presence. And so that was definitely attractive to someone like Julie, who was looking or to look into, um, being my agent, but then also when pitching my work, it just is an, a nice thing to drop in. But at the same time, I didn't really have this in-depth uh, range of artwork at the moment because I had a lot of floral stuff because I was painting for wedding invitations. So I had a lot of floral and like, but it wasn't really organized in a way. I didn't have any patterns made out of anything because I wasn't doing that. I was doing wedding stationery. So it was a lot of like spot art. And so there wasn't much that she could really do with my library of work, but she did have like, she has an established business. She has X amount of followers on Instagram. So there was that little Foot in the door and then we i had the license already ready to go with nomadics and so that was attractive to julie when um potentially thinking about working with me but it's been a process the last like three or four years that julie and i have worked together on my specific um biz licensing business just because i had to learn so much so quickly and go from being art directed by my clients to now being the art director of the work that i do and the collections that i create and learning how to design prints and what goes into full collections and what category, like all the thought process that goes into it. So Julie can probably speak more into like how you get the foot in the door with the big, the big name retail stores. Um, but it's been relatively easy to get like smaller companies like a Toki Mats or Little Sleepies, Nomadics, obviously approaching because they're, they're um, just looking on my Instagram or whatever, and then will approach us. Mm. But as far as big brands go, that's all Julie um, pitching. So take it away, Julie. <laughs> well, you know, I think Jenna doesn't give herself credit because she had it when I 
when I met her, she already had a book deal and that's a license. And that came through Instagram. And that was a pretty big one. You know, that you now are working on your third. Did you just finish your third watercolor book? Almost done. Yeah. And it's like in multiple languages and so forth. So it's, you know, that came through Instagram. And I definitely feel like social media, it's interesting because my, the business, the licensing business is very old, old school. And a lot of these manufacturers are, you know, owned by older men. I mean, that's not always the case, but so they're not as. (laughs) savvy. They're not like scouring Instagram and social media looking for opportunities. Um, They're asking their retail buyers and looking at trends and things like that. So sometimes these kinds of opportunities come about if you have products in anthropology and some of these big manufacturers that are selling to TJ Maxx walk into an anthropology looking at trends and they find a brand or they find a design or a look. Sometimes it comes about, comes about that way. Um, It's definitely, I'm when I started my business, there was this trend towards going directly to the retailer. It still exists, but going directly to the retailer and doing a pitch to the retailer and getting a whole section in their store and getting them to commit all these marketing resources, like what you see with Target and Missoni. And that still exists. But I think the best way to get into these stores is to find the manufacturers that sell to them. Um, and those, how do you get those manufacturers? You can have an agent that has a relationship with them or knows where to find them. Trade shows now with COVID has become a little bit of a challenge, but I'm pretty confident that in the next year or so, we're going to see them come back to life in some kind of a way. People really need them, you know, even established people really need them. And then, yeah, I mean, I think finding, having, having some comfort level with some sort of social media to put yourself out there in the digital sphere makes sense um, because There are art directors that are looking on these platforms that, you know, may work for a manufacturer and they may find you because they follow you or found you on Instagram and that could run you up the flagpole at a a company. So it can come up, you know, there can be some really great opportunities that you can get through having a great presence on on social and reaching out to companies and, you know, having them check out what you do. So, you know, it's, I, I agree with Jenna, it's different for everybody and you kind of have to know where you feel the most comfortable and where you shine and play that up. Um, so yeah, it depends. Gotcha. So how important do you think having that social media presence is? I've heard, you know, kind of opinions all over the spectrum, but it sounds like that kind of got you started, Jenna, um, so how, you know, how do you feel like you would maybe approach this if you didn't have a large social following or how important is it to, for artists to try to build that if they're wanting to have this type of career? I mean, we were just talking about this yesterday, Julie, because we we've been revamping some of our course brand plus brand. We were just re-recording a lesson on pitching and talking about, you know, lo- really looking at your strengths. And so obviously mine at the moment when we first started working together was my social media presence and the book deal that I forgot about. Um, but I'm unlike her other client at the time and still is her other client, Dabney Lee, who has this huge, huge, huge library of work and like turnkey uh, prints and patterns that, you know, manufacturers and brands looking through her library of work could see this on this type of product or this print on, on this other type of product. So it was just easy for her to play that up and she doesn't have as strong of a social media presence. Um, and Julie can definitely speak into this too, but like it, it's all about, you know, making sure that you're really sitting with what is your strengths? Where do you, what's your dream collab or like, what are your goals with your licensing business? Is it to like be an anthropology? Is it to have Um, smaller like baby product deals like there's so many opportunities within a licensing business and then kind of um, going I mean honestly we go through informative shopping and uh, how to get contacts and licensing in the course Um, and Julie shows you and walks you through her entire process as an agent of like how to look at labels and like figure out who manufactured these products or whatever Um, and so that's a really great resource in there but Um, it really doesn't, I guess, to sum it all up, it really doesn't have to, you don't have to have a strong social media in order to be successful in licensing, or you don't have to, it's just really playing up to your strengths. And Julie probably has more to add too. Yeah. I mean, I think that it certainly doesn't help if you are, you know, savvy with social and have a great following. It 
definitely doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt to have that. In fact, it helps a lot because it's just another kind of data point. I think that, you know, manufacturers and even sometimes retailers will want to know when they're looking at a collection, you know, in a new brand, you know, what, what's the certain retailers care about it more than others. Um, and so I wouldn't discount it, but I also think that if you aren't into it, like, you know, I, I'm of a generation where this is just doesn't come secondhand and Dabney is a little closer to me in age and has just pretty much decided that she just doesn't want to, she does not like we were getting, there was a period of time where we were getting the feedback of like, this product is selling really well. Now imagine if you ramped up your social, how much bigger and better and greater it would be. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, we start, we like started going down that road. And after some soul searching, she was like, I just don't really want to do this. But at the same time, she had other things going on. So she has, she has her own, she has a store. She had, you know, a wholesale product line before this that she doesn't have anymore, but that's how she started. So she did have a different kind of business story and trajectory um, getting into this. So I think I would recommend for somebody who doesn't have, and it's not so easy to build a following these days. Like we do have lessons and tips in the course to help with that. But I, I think it's, you have to be honest, like it's not that easy to, you know, get up to the level of hundreds and thousands of followers from scratch these days. So, you know, it's probably not a bad idea to be at a trade event, like a Surtex where there are manufacturers walking through and looking at art and maybe, you know, I wouldn't normally recommend it for somebody who is like a social media star, but I might recommend it for a brand that needs some plate, you know, needs to, to be, to be discovered somewhere. So, um, yeah, that's my, that's my thought on social media. And it's kind of like, you know, I think we all, I even as an agent go through, you know, just the frustration and, um, just the annoyance and frustration, but yet the beauty of it, when it does work, it's, you know, when, there, it does feel really good when you put yourself out there and then you start attracting things. You can be very intentional with it. And I feel like the universe, the universe will know what your intentions are if you find a place to have a voice. So Instagram happens to be one that's pretty easy for everybody. Right. Yeah. I think um, we all think about Instagram first, probably. And I think Jenna, maybe that's where you kind of got started with, you know, developing such a large following. Um I also, I mean, I've also heard though, you don't need like such a huge audience as long as you have like the right people following you, which again is hard for artists. Like, how do we know, you know, a lot of times artists follow other artists and it would be great if like buyers were following us um, or art directors and things like that. And maybe the way to meet them, I don't know, you know, and like you said, I've heard, um, you know, that sometimes the art licensing world can be kind of old school, but maybe that's, you know, more of the top level people. But I think a lot of the buyers are on Instagram. I've had people contact me on Instagram as well. Um, but Jenna, you're also, you know, growing a lot on YouTube as well. And so would you share with us a little bit about, you know, maybe why you're focusing on YouTube and kind of how that's working for your business? Yeah. So I started a YouTube, I probably started way later than I should have, cause I've been getting asked through probably, um, since 2015 when I got my first book deal with my publisher. Um, and that just kind of naturally meant that I was now teaching watercolor to people through the book deal and then my second book. And so got asked quite a bit for years to get on YouTube. Why aren't you on YouTube? You need to be teaching tutorials. And I was like, YouTube, I'm focused on Instagram. Instagram's Instagram's the hot sexy (laughs) thing. And now I'm like, boo, Instagram, not to like be annoying, like whatever, but you know, it's just like, it's getting so but so um I'm loving YouTube but I've been on YouTube for about two years now um my husband John uh he was at a moment where he was ready to quit his old job and we could take him on full time to do something with the generating LLC but we're like what could you do um because he's (laughs) he's not a creative I mean he is creative everyone's creative but he wasn't like He's not a designer or anything. So he decided to um, buy some film equipment and like, you should be on YouTube. So let's start a YouTube channel. And he basically dove into all things, learning how to 
video like he, all of our videos are professionally shot and they look amazing and he does all the filming and editing and music and all of that so yeah um started it two years ago and now we're at over 130,000 subscribers or something like that and um posting tutorials every week twice a week and i also have a patreon now where i do exclusive tutorials and um, it just felt really natural to me to start the YouTube channel because I taught piano lessons when I was in high school to little kids. I taught watercolor through the books that I've been writing and teaching, I feel like is something that I'm very good at. And now I have online classes like with Julie, our brand plus brand course and um, taught a few courses with Britain Co up in San Francisco. So teaching is something that I've just naturally been like really good at. Uh, humble brag, but um, I just <laughs> you are, you know, I can attest to that. You are very good. <laughs> um, I really love it. I taught in person workshops for nine years where I got to travel all over the world, like Singapore, Australia, France, all the all over, and just do amazing things through teaching and meeting amazing people. And then now, obviously, since COVID and whatnot, like most things have been online. So it's just like a perfect time for us to start right before COVID. And then when coronavirus came through and lockdowns were happening and all of that, um, more people were searching online for YouTube like tutorials, for art tutorials. And so I launched the first week there was lockdowns in California or in the US. I launched the Generini Art School and had a daily session or whatever of covering a different topic every single day live on YouTube. And that really took off. People loved it. They had their kids join and they were you know, posting about it on social media. So that was a fun like boost and surge for the channel, but then also just like really exciting to be providing um, this medium and this platform to teach people watercolor and art. Nice. Um, yeah, I think sometimes Instagram can feel a bit like a rat race because you're constantly having to post. So it's just, it takes a lot of energy. And um, I like the fact that YouTube is more of a long form content model and that, you know, if you put a YouTube video out there, it can continue to get views because it's ser more search based um, mm -hmm. or that, you know, the algorithm will recommend stuff that didn't just come out yesterday, you know, that came out maybe a year ago. And um, yeah, I love, I love binging art YouTube videos. Like my husband will walk by and be like, what are you watching? I'm like, oh, art porn, you know, just yeah. <laughs> watching people paint. <laughs> yeah. But um, mm -hmm. so if other artists are out there listening and they've thought about starting a YouTube channel, like what kind of tips would you give them or what, you know, what would you recommend um, for artists who might want to start a YouTube channel soon today? Or, yeah. yeah. So my first just kind of very broad uh, tip is quality over quantity. Um, there is this kind of fine balance between quantity, because obviously the more you post on any sort of search engine, the more the search engine is going to like that. But at the same time, treating it like a search engine and I think of it like posting pieces of content on Google. So like when you have a blog or a website, um, you have Google algorithm bots that are scanning every single piece of content on your website to make sure that the keywords are matching the title in the description, and the you know headings of the blog post and matching it best to the user's search in the keywords that they're using to literally type in the search bar. So if you're just posting content to have daily content come out because you think that that's the ticket to success, if that's your ultimate goal with your YouTube channel is to grow it and to have, you know, grow subscribers, um, then you're probably going to find that it's not going to be as successful for you if you were to just double down on creating really quality content and thinking about the end user. So the person who is typing in the search bar to find your channel or to find your specific tutorials what words are they using to write in the search bar? Are they, you know, more niche and narrow and specific keywords or are they really broad? If you're using keywords that are really broad, like watercolor tutorial for your titles, you're gonna have millions and millions and millions of other pieces of content or other videos on YouTube to compete with. And so it's really, if you're thinking like strategy wise, you have to think about how search engines operate, how they feed the user, the searcher, content based upon the words that they're using in their search bar and then search results, you know, like how high up you end up in search results once once somebody hits enter um, is really something to dive into too. But thinking about your thumbnail and is it eye catching or are people going to just scroll right by when they're scrolling through and how can you make that you know, not um, clickbaity, but you, it's clickbaity enough. Like if you do some, any sort of 
amount of time on YouTube, any sort of research, you'll see there's a specific type of thumbnail that people create for their videos. That's like, you have the big red X and the green check mark or like a big slash through something like it's definitely clickbaity. But at the same time, it's like, we have to think about like, how are we gonna get more eyeballs on our content? If we really believe in the tutorials or the content that we're putting out on our YouTube channel, then there is some sort of element of strategy that you have to think about. And then you have the random people who just like hit major success without even trying, but, um, <laughs> and that's so annoying. But, you know, searching, searching, doing keyword research, there's um, YouTube Buddy is I think what it's called. John can correct me. He's not in here, but YouTube Buddy um, is a great uh, platform to do some keyword research and to test the scores for your titles, for your videos and that sort of thing. So it'll give you like a, a test on how well it will perform in search. Um, and just kind of diving into SEO is a good idea because most people who are launching a YouTube channel, especially if they're creatives, which is this audience, um, they know very little, if anything, about search engine optimization and how search engines even work. And it's definitely nothing like Instagram. Um, and so it's really a great platform to um, get seen on because it's a search engine and it's not just going to show you the most popular stuff. It's going to show you the, the things that you're searching for. So if you're really smart and strategic about the keywords that you use in your titles and your you know, descriptions of your videos and then making sure to focus on quality content, then I see it being a really great platform for creatives. Wonderful. Um, so it sounds like it's been helpful in building your brand. Um, and I know you and uh, Julie created this course called Brand Plus Brand. Um, so could you tell us some of the like building blocks to creating a successful brand, like some of the key elements? Yeah, so, <laughs> so many things. Um, but I mean, I would say going back to that um, question, sorry, if you can hear my child, he's in the next room getting okay. sick. <laughs> just give up. Um, so some of the building blocks, I would just get really, really clear on your goals and who, um, what your dreams are with your business. Like for me, it's been always to get into textile design and um, what that looks like for me is going to look different for somebody who is also interested in textile design, but has a different style. And so really thinking about like, what are your dreams with your business and what are your goals for your business? And then what that means behind the scenes, like who you're talking to, who your ideal followers or customers would be. So for me, like, obviously it's nice to have, you know, contacts at Blue Sky or contacts at whatever manufacturing company or agents like Julie following me on Instagram, but ultimately, um, you know, it's about the people buying the products in those stores. And so having the people that actually walk through Staples and actually walk through Target or Anthropology or whatever, following me on Instagram, is more attractive to the manufacturer than, oh, I follow this artist on Instagram and she, you know, whatever. So thinking about creating prints and products and artwork for those people. And this is beyond licensing too, like even with my courses and with my books and with my, when I had my wedding stationery business, it's always comes down to who your ideal client is and who you ultimately want to do business with. Um, and if that aligns with you or not, and then like doing some research on Pinterest, on Instagram, and just kind of getting to know who your audience is so you can put out work that really resonates with them. And I'm sure Julie has, she's nodding, but I think she probably has some. Other yeah. I mean, I could go on and on and on about this. There's, um, I mean, I agree with Jenna. I think being very, I think one thing that all businesses all, like, I feel like this applies to kind of anything is getting very clear and very intentional about what you want to do. Because I do think that a lot of people kind of know what their goals are and what they want to create, but they might spend 90% of their time in the day doing something that's counter to that and not even realizing it. So I think like what Jenna's saying is it's been very interesting to, to work with her because she's definitely been able to attract great opportunities and get, you know, get to the negotiate, negotiating table being, ha having the kind of following that she has on Instagram. But her content hasn't always been about people falling in love with her specific design aesthetic. It's always around her, but it's never been something that she's actually really pushed or talked about or engaged with her following regularly in that kind of way. And I think it definitely 
you know, I think the more she does that, the more it will get her into building a a great licensed product brand as opposed to a media brand or an education brand. So, you know, to have the ability to get clear on that, which, you know, we definitely advise and show different ways of being able to do that in the course, it's, it's kind of key. Um, and, you know, no matter what business you're running to take a look at what your goals are and then do an inventory of how you're spending your time or what you're talking about and what you're doing and see how, how well those two things align. Um, but then on a more like practical, what can I do? What, like, what are the actual, like, you know, what's the checklist <laughs> for building a brand um, and particularly a licensed product brand? There's an exercise in the class that's like called, are you ready to license? Where it goes through like a series of questions that I ask, that I look at when I think about any brand that I'm evaluating for myself or clients that I'm working with or people that I'm coaching it's, it's a checklist to kind of see, well, where do you fall on the spectrum of having a very distinctive style that people can really recognize very easily if your name's not on the product. And, you know, um, there's just a whole bunch of questions in there that you can ask yourself to kind of see where you're at. Um, and what you, what areas you may need to work on. A lot of times it's, I would say the two things that people need to work on the most would be either, having a marketing platform or social media or, you know, some place where people can find you. And the second would be working on honing in on, you know, having a library that has, that clearly can define your style. Um, It doesn't mean it has to be totally unique from everybody else's, but just how do you define your style? And can like, if somebody were to work with you today and they were still working with you five years from now, would they know what they, would they be able to like, look at it and say five years from now, this is still going to be relevant. And I'm still going to know exactly what this brand is all about. Um, so, and then, yeah, so those are the, so I would say that a lot of what, um, a lot of the direction on that is, is, has been kind of put into this course that we designed not to plug it too much, but, um, I think that's one of the benefits of being able to take it and kind of see behind the scenes of how, like how my mind works and what, I do with my, with the own brands that I work with so that you can be a little bit more clear and intentional about in building your own brand. What exactly do you need? You know, what, what are the, what are the different things that you need to do and need to be thinking about and working on? Um, It's all kind of in the class. Yeah. So what are some of the major mistakes you see artists making then? Is it like a lack of clarity, a lack of focus, a lack of direction? Like, Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that I see over and over again is, um, almost like, uh, I think a lot, a lot of the artists that I encounter, at least in my, like on social media and people that I meet that come to me and want to want an evaluation, um, are people who go from having a custom business to wanting to be a brand and not really taking the time to, recognize whether or or like understand how distinctly different those two things are um even though one thing could lead to another very easily it what what i find happens a lot is this kind of like fear like you know what do you have to give up in order to be able to kind of make the leap from designing for others and design and building your own brand and being able to kind of also decide what is your own unique style? Like if I've been designing wedding invitations for 10 years, or I've been doing custom logos for people for 10 years, or I've been working in house at a company, you know, working on their brands and their private label stuff. What's the difference between what I've been doing for them and what I would actually create for my brand. So I don't know if I would say it's a mistake. It's just sort of like a soul searching exercise that you need to kind of go through. And it's a discipline that you need to get into. I think it kind of leads into the second thing that I see a lot, which is um, uh, people who are really creative, but maybe they haven't created enough work to make a big licensing pitch. So, you know, not having a library that is filled out to the point where it's like turnkey and really ready for a, you know, a bigger company to take on. So I think, you know, when you're in that situation and you're just getting started, there's probably some collaborations and some like kind of custom licenses and smaller projects that you can do to kind of build that up. But are you willing to take the time 
to actually like set aside time to just create every week for your own library so that you have built up enough that when somebody a bigger comes along and they want to sign a three-year deal with you, that you they can actually see that there's going to be work for them to license in three years. There's enough go- to go around, if that makes sense. Um, when I was working with Jonathan Adler, he had it built into his calendar every week sitting at the pottery wheel because even though his brand had become something bigger than that. Like at the end of the day, that was like the craft that was like the key driver behind the whole thing. And you need to have that time to just sit and create. And I think when you're getting paid to create, you don't often do that. So I think that's probably a mis- one of one mistake that I see or one, like one thing that I think just needs to be pointed out. Yeah. Another mistake that I see too, and you would probably agree with this too, Julie, because We see it a lot in students in the course when they were first starting and then probably through pitches you get on Instagram is like, there's things that are trending now that are like rampant on social media, or you could do some Pinterest searching. A lot of people have instilled really, or artists have instilled really bad habits of like hopping on social media or hopping on Pinterest to find inspiration or to find something to paint. Um, And it's really looking outside of like a source that you could literally just replicate certain things from it. Um, Looking outside of your own medium where you're, you know, I'm a watercolor artist. So looking outside and like actually looking outside for inspiration Mm -hmm. instead of, you know, looking at other watercolor artists. So I see a lot of artists getting trapped in like where to find inspiration actually for their work. And it's just like, they're creating what somebody else would create for their brand and not really again, doing a soul searching exercise and figuring out like what uh, they actually want to be creating and what's calling their name or lighting their fire. Yeah. So Jenna, did your, sorry, go ahead, Julie. Oh, no, no, go ahead. (laughs) I was just going to ask Jenna if, um, if you developed your branding and your art style kind of at the same time, or did you create one direction kind of first, how did you kind of develop your brand along with your um, unique style? So it's definitely changed a lot this past year. Um, the, I mean, if you just think about how my business started, I was serving clients. And so my branding and like messaging, my images, all the, the work that I was doing was to serve a particular type of person, a engaged couple who was a, like, has a, has a bigger budget, more elevated taste. Like eventually once I started getting like more well-known in the wedding stationery business and I wasn't doing lower budget client jobs, I was doing like more high-end jobs. Um, and so my branding, my messaging, my, co- my images, all and all the artwork that I was posting and putting out online was kind of centered around the work that I was doing and the clients that I was working with. And so that morphed into a, a total beast that I like had no control over at times. So because again, I was directed by my clients and I had to do what they wanted to do because it was their wedding. So obviously I would say no to things that were, weren't in my style or whatever, but like they had a very specific color palette because it had to match their bridesmaids dresses, the flowers had to match their centerpieces, you know, whatever. Um, and so for the first five years plus I was, very like much not attached to this brand that I had built. And I feel like that happens with a lot of people in the beginning, the first few years, you're just kind of like trying to get your foot in the door somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I found myself like working in weddings when I was like very grateful that I had this as my start and I could, you know, scale it to six figures and do all these cool things and get a book deal through it like simultaneously. Um, But at the same time, I wasn't attached. It didn't feel aligned to aligned to, what I wanted to do as an artist. And so it did take me even a couple of years until this last year. So I've been working with Julie for like three or four years. And I would say it wasn't until this last year, I really started, it started clicking for me of like how, a, what a lifestyle brand even is and the work that's really like feels aligned to me to do. Like I've always been called, uh, to colors and color palettes. I love color theory. My mom used to teach color theory when um, I was in junior high. She used to teach it to junior hires through like a homeschool co-op that we were a part of. And so it wasn't like super, you know, whoa, your, your mom was a high, or high school color t- theory teacher. She was like doing it for a handful of people. Um, but anyway, it was, it's always been very interesting to me. And so how does that inform the work that I do now and the licensing work that I do and the collections that I create and I, treat like the colors in all of my collections. Like I'm 
going on a discovery, like I'm telling a story through color and I'm figuring out ways to like add more contrast or lessen contrast or be more subtle or create a story through color. Um, whether the collection is, you know, really subtle in color and peaceful or if it's loud and proud. Um, and so that's something that I've been just kind of discovering the last year. Um, and so I would say the short answer to my long winded answer to your question would be that it's been simultaneous and it's been nine and a half years that I've had my business and it's the last year that I've really felt aligned and felt like it's clicking. And so for people who are watching, who are building a business and think that they need to have all their things dialed right from the get-go, that's just not true. Um, and it's best to like get your feet wet and really figure out what you like to do and come back to telling your story. Mm -hmm. Julie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. I mean, I've watched Jenna evolve, you know, over the years that we've worked together. And even just when we got started, her name was Mon Boir, or I don't know how to pronounce it. I can't pronounce yeah. French. Nobody can. Nobody yeah. can. So I changed so, it. Which is the reason why we changed the name to Jenna Rainey. So her literal brand, her brand name and branding all went through like a pretty quick overhaul when we started working together. Cause I, you know, one of the pieces of advice and maybe it's, um, it's a little bit, actually, I would say I've had three clients with French business names that changed <laughs> their names when they got into licensing and like said, I regret ever, you know, cause yeah. if you can't pronounce it, it some, there's certain instances yeah. where it can make consumers almost uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and it just made sense to change to her name. She like did overnight when I said to her, I think this is something you're need, you're going to need to do to get into licensing. So I've watched that transformation, but yeah, I mean, when I started working with Jenna, she, you know, even with the licensing opportunities that came her way, she'd be like, okay, what do they want me to do? And I would be like, well, they want to know what you want to do, you know, like, and so training her, or, you know, get, getting her used to that idea. Mm -hmm. And then I've watched again, she kind of alludes to what's happened over this past year. But at one point we just had a conversation about a year ago because we work together. I'm her licensing agent. We also create this class together. The class has been very successful, more like beyond what we, what we thought would happen, but kind of beyond. And so a lot of our dealings together have really been centered around the class and licensing in some ways has played a little bit of a backseat because I think during this time, Jenna has been sort of you know, when she does something, she does it like she's aced it. And so I've seen her kind of like almost dabbling in licensing and trying to figure out what it really means to her. And at some point in this past, this past year, we had a conversation about it, just what it means in your life to be a creative and to be able to create and make a living off of the, the work that you've created and then voila, this textile designer just emerged and it's a real, it's, her work is always great and it always looks like it's Jenna's, but you know, it, it was, it's amazing. It's been amazing for me to see her really take the time and go through her own process mm -hmm. to figure out what she really, what she really wants to be in this business and, and how she wants to approach the process of creating and designing collections. And, you know, it's almost like she's, taking the class and like learning everything about licensing as we go. And, um, and so I've really seen a huge shift and it can happen. And so I agree with Jenna that like, you don't have to have it all figured out. Um, sometimes you just have to go through whatever your process is to learn. Um, but you know, uh, you can start out as a textile designer and be, or you can start out as a, apparel brand and get into home, you know, you can do those, you can cross over and you can, you can morph and change and grow and create through this process. So it can be, you know, what is it? Iterative, iterate, iter iterative, iterative, I think is the word. Like you can, you know, you can, you know, change things along the way. And I think at the end of the day, you just kind of have to do you. And I think people will know when you're, coming when everything is coming from a place of authenticity. I know that's kind of like a cliche buzz buzzword, but I think it really is true in this business that, you know, if you want to break out, you, you do, people are looking to you as the creative to actually like dictate more than what you probably think um, mm -hmm. when you're, you know, when you're getting into it, people will rely on you for leadership and for your style and for your ideas more than you think.
So, yeah, I think that's the hardest thing for artists. I know for me personally, like that's something I've definitely struggled with because, you know, in Jenna's case, she was working with so many clients and I'm used to working in house and having an art director tell me what to do, or at least like provide a trend direction or something, you know, then, you know, you work within that umbrella. So yeah, I think exactly what you just said, like being the one to set the direction and be like, this is kind of be the trendsetter in a way. Um, with your brand, I think is really difficult for artists. So when you are developing an art style, do you think it's important for artists to stick to like maybe one subject matter, one medium, like what would you say are some of the key components to, you know, at least like sort of narrowing down, um, you know, your take on an art style? Uh, yeah, it's kind of a hard one for me to answer. I feel like you, uh, and Jenna and I were just talking about this yesterday, literally just talking about this yesterday, because I, I don't want to say like, this is how you do it, but right. I kind of described the process similar to kind of like a scientific sorting experiment. So, you know, take the time to, I wouldn't say like, you only need to be, you can't, if you're working in watercolor, you can't work in gouache or you can't do, you know, something geometric. If people know you for florals, Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, like there, there might come a point when you are doing so many florals with a point of no, like a point where at which people won't believe you can do anything else, or like, it doesn't appear credible or, you know, there, there are brands that are built in that manner. But I think if you do like to experiment with different styles, you have to do kind of a, a scientific sorting process and figure out, well, what is the one thing thread that that unites all of these things and make sure that you can communicate that, that it would make sense for you to be able to, for a consumer to see it for another, you know, company you're pitching to see it. And that when you're approaching your collections, you make sure that like everything has that element. So sometimes it's color, you know, sometimes artists might do florals and geometrics and, you know, animals and all kinds of other themes but there's a color story that appears throughout that is very distinctive. And other times it is, you know, by the hand. Um, you know, I, wor I work with a designer named Dabney Lee and she's all about these graphic happy patterns and mixing prints. And so color does come into it. And recently somebody, a buyer came along and said, um, we really like Vera Bradley. Can you do Vera Bradley? And it's like, well, she's not Vera Bradley, you know? So it's like, no, but Work with Vera Bradley, do Vera Bradley, what's the Dabney yeah. Lee way of doing Vera Bradley? Like, yeah. so we figured out like, well, if she's going to quilt, maybe it's like, you know, quilted, quilted geometrics, you know, or maybe her um, paisleys are a little bit more graphic in nature than they would be, or her colors might be more distinctive. It's like, you kind of have to know your style well enough and, and have gone through that exercise to know when those kinds of instances come up where that cause you to have to broaden your range that you know how how you're going to do it is it through color is it through texture is it through is it I never do floral you know you gotta you have to just sort of know know your style well enough to know how to how it's going to evolve in that way so hopefully that answers yeah definitely Jenna what do you think well and just tying it into my story of discovery of discovering like how I would art direct my own creative process and what I create, um, by all means, explore different mediums. But I think exactly what Julie was saying, like when you're thinking about building a brand and creating a brand story, you think about recognition. Like when I walk through a store, let, let's just talk about, I was just in the container store the other day buying some containers and they have like a little <laughs> stationary section and planners and all this like desk office supply section immediately I know those planners are rifle paper company, like the colors she uses, the style of floral. And, you know, when you repeat something over and over and over again, you do it over and over and over again, you become, you become known for it. You become recognizable on a shelf with a million other planners, or, you know, if you're in anthropology, people can pick out your prints on those shorts or whatever. So I think there's this kind of balance of like allowing yourself to have creative play and still like discovering things and doing things that really light you up and are exciting to you. But then at the same time, building a brand does require, especially in licensing, does require some sort of like, okay, I can see the potential that this brand has in licensing because they're treating it like a lifestyle brand. Like they are recognizable, they're memorable. Um, those flowers are very distinct um, and, you know, trend forward or whatever. So 
I think it's like kind of this fine balance. And for me in the past couple of years that I've been trying to do this soul searching stuff uh, in my business, it's just like, what, what do people think of, or what do people feel when they see my work and what words pop into their minds? Like literally what adjectives would pop in someone's mind if they're walking, walking through Staples and they see my planner collection or they're seeing my work online on my Instagram. And so just kind of playing with that, but also getting really um, good, just like writing it down and actually doing the exercise. And what do you want people to feel could be very different from what you're actually making people feel with the work that you're creating. So I think that's kind of a answer to your question. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. So for those of you who are watching, if you want a link to their course, um, it is linked in the description below. Jenna's website and YouTube channel um, are also linked below so you can find it there. Um, But my next question, Jenna, was going to be if you follow trends um, at all, because some designers, you know, love to follow trends, you know, they're all about that. And some say, you know, I think following trends is kind of cheap. I want to focus more on, you know, what I want to say to the world. So what do you think about trends? Do you think trends uh, are important to follow in your art projects? Absolutely. I mean, you got to get people to buy your work if you want to have a successful business and licensing. So, I mean, I don't want to say that to be like, you have to do exactly what the trend says or whatever, because it's so nuancy and it's very fluid. Um, But I think just in general, like even thinking about this last year that we've had, I love to think about like, I do this with my courses. I do this with my book. Like, I don't just do this with licensing and I've only just started doing this with licensing to like, I'm, I love marketing. I love thinking about like strategy and numbers and all of that kind of business stuff has just somehow been built into my genetics. And so I really love it. And so being able to weave that into my licensing business has been really fun for me. And so thinking about, you know, currently we're post-ish almost uh, pandemic uh, era of our time in our lives. And a lot of people have spent a lot of time in their homes, probably picking out all of the areas that they want to revamp. Maybe they want new art on the walls or new furniture or, you know, bringing some sense of calm into their home is really important to people right now because everything is chaotic outside, chaotic in the world and all of that. So thinking about like broad macro trends like that, can be a way for people who don't really have that brain of like doing trend research and like really don't want to spend the time doing it, but just thinking like on a broad global scale, just like what are some of the macro trends and like bringing nature inside would be another one because people have spent a lot of time inside of their house. So like thinking about those deeper greens and like leaf patterns, botanical and floral and stuff. So um, it can be really basic and broad like that. And then you can get really, really intricate on trend forecasting. And we, Julie actually has a lesson inside of brand plus brand where we talk about trend forecasting and research and how to do that within a licensing business model. Um, But I think in general, it's a good idea to at least have some sort of pulse on trends um, and consumer trends. Because again, if you do, whether the retail store is Staples or it's a small, you know, local shop, Um, it's important to really think about, well, is this even going to sell? And also when you are creating work, is it going to sell on wall art or is it going to sell on a big bed sheet? So there's a lot that goes into it really that I think is important to think about when you are creating work as the end consumer and when it's going to be launching and who it's going to, who that end, end consumer is going to be at that time. Gotcha. I have a little something to add to that because I definitely feel like trends are very important for most designer, you know, surface pattern designers, artists, like it's very important to know what, what trends are happening in the design world. And also like even in products, like what products are trending um, or what markets are trending, but sometimes there are certain brands that are what they are, no matter what the trends are. So, and those are very special brands like you know, if you think about Mary Mecco or you think about like, even I represented a, a brand called French Bull, which it just was like groovy, crazy patterns, all with a very distinctive palette. Like she used the same exact colors for every print, but they were just all in all, and they were always wild. Um, and there might be new areas that like that brand would go into like kids, you know, like have started in adults and then like, what does it look like in kids? And when I do like little character art, you know, how does that translate. So that might be an example of something or like a Mary Mecco or, or look highly, which is that kind of mid-century modern mm-hmm. look where 
it is what it is, no matter what the trends are, but the, the way the trend comes in might be in the kinds of product that it goes into. So maybe it got its start, you know, being, you know, a fabric line, but the way that trends come in is if tech accessories are trending, they're going to do tech accessories or, you know, so I think I, I advise people to pay attention to the trends. And I think by and large, like depending on what kind of brand you have, you're going to have your licensees and the buyers, the retail stores kind of dictating also what they think the trends are. And you're going to have to adapt to that too. And it's like a give and take, but I wouldn't also discount the idea that you could build a library that is one of those kind of Mary Mecco formulas where it's just all built on something that is so unique that there, if, as long as there's a customer for it, it's never going to change. Yeah, that's interesting. So how does an artist know when a trend kind of breaks with their own brand that they're trying to build up? Like when should they follow a trend? When should they ignore a trend? That kind of thing. Oh, man. I know. I think that boils down to instinct. Honestly, I think that, you know, kind of being the author of your own brand and the creative director behind your own brand and doing you doing you like maybe you kind of know what's hitting and what, you know, like Jenna mentions some of the things that are going on in the world that are influencing her work. So she kind of has context for that. But, um, you know, I think that I think it's a combination of that, or if you already have licensees, a lot of times they will tell you what they want you to do. Or, or, you know, we had like one licensee, like lead us through creating a whole new color story for Dabney's brand because mint was trend, the color mint, or they called it sea foam. We decided <laughs> to call it, yeah, like they called it sea foam. So we decided to call it mint. That's that's, an ex- you know, that's sort of an example of like adapting. Cause she was like, I've never done that color before, but like, if you call it mint, this is how I do mint. And it was, you know, it was a home trend that was going on. And I, I don't think that she would have walked through the stores and said, Hey, I want to do this color way. But like, she got some feedback that it needed to go in that direction. And, you know, so that's, that's, you know, those are my thoughts on that, but there are, are also trend services that, you know, some people I've had designers ask me like, should I, you know, subscribe to WGSN and really look at trends when I'm designing? And I think, you know, it's, it's part, it's, you have to decide what your process is and how you incorporate what's happening in the world into your work. I definitely advise that you pay attention to what's going on in other stores and other brands. So. Yeah. And for me, like what, I mean, this happened quite literally for me too, with the Staples Club with uh, Blue Sky doing planners and like, I hate the color purple. I've been very vocal about it on, <laughs> sorry to every purple lover. I have recently found a purple that I like and it's like a grayish purple. Um, but supposedly the customer, Staples customer loves purple and they just have this data on their customer and the color purple. And so when I submitted the first round of uh, creative to Blue Sky, they were like, this is great, but can we add some florals or some purple in the florals? And I was like, purple? <laughs> <laughs> um, happy to do it because it's it's just a color and it's not like they're forcing me to paint like something that I, I just don't paint. Um, but there are instances like that, I guess, like to get back to your point where you're going to be, uh, need to be a little bit flexible Um, but then at the same time, always coming back to like making sure that you're memorable and recognizable and like creating work that sure is on trend. But like, if I were to, if I were to paint it, like I've never painted a sloth in my life. And that's been a recent trend in the past couple of years is like sloths everywhere. Mm -hmm. I've never painted a sloth. I'm not really interested in painting a sloth. I'm not known for sloths. Um, and so it's just something that I didn't really pick up and add into my work. Um, but I do really like birds. If I'm going to do an animal, I might do a bird print or I might do, obviously I'm known for floral and that sort of stuff. So I think it's, you know, important to always come back to like what Julie is saying is like, what are you wanting to be known for really? Yeah. So what are some of the trends that both of you might be anticipating for 2022, even maybe 2023? Yeah. Any insights? (laughs) You want me to go first? Sure, go for it. Um, you know, I think home is definitely like category wise, business wise, home and home office, um, I think are going to continue to be really strong. Um, I think on the one hand, neutrals 
and, you know, tone on tone neutrals has been like a big thing. Um, but at the same time, on the totally opposite end of the spectrum, wild, crazy, happy, you know, just wild, crazy, happy, bring a smile to your face, like farm Rio, you know, Miami, like just color, color, color. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I have, I've, I've, I've have found in the past, like, I want to say five years or so where it's like, it's kind of anything goes, it feels very, anything goes. And then these things, these themes do pop in, like it could be like tacos and llamas one second and sloths and um, avocado toast the next. It's like, there's always that novelty thing that you kind of you know, bubble tea, you know, it was like coffee and now it's bubble tea, you know, it was cupcakes. Now it's then it turns to macaroons. There's always a little bit of that, that, you know, a kind of a novelty theme going on. But, um, you know, I think the, the funny thing about design is that it, I think there is this kind of range where even when neutrals and tech, like all, all cream with a touch of black is like, a theme that I see in design, but then I could just as easily turn around and see the craziest color combinations and just the craziest prints at yeah. the same time trending. Yeah, I'm, I second everything Julie's saying, a lot of neutrals and calming stuff, especially like what I said earlier with like post pandemic, people are wanting to bring through all the unrest, wanting to bring some sort of lack of chaos into their home. Well, specifically in that category, but then like you just think about other aspects of our life like technology is growing so quickly and things are becoming what seems very otherworldly and so having that sort of like fantastical like almost holographic really bright uh colors as well I feel like our you know upcoming trends for 22 and 23 and bringing joy and happy um to people's lives after just like going through what we've all gone through the past year plus um and so I I personally like focus on or try to focus on those bigger broader themes versus like oh that specific print is trending right now or that specific color or whatever because I think you can kind of make it in your, your own but in a way it seems like too there's a lot of like while things are going otherworldly and fantastical and like not unicorn but like not ser like literally unicorns but just like that like bright cheerful it feels like there's also this like grounding happening with like 1970s, lots of amber and neutral tones on neutral with like pops of color. So I think that that just in general kind of loops in people's ultimate feelings for like psychological feelings of where the world is at and where they're wanting to head. Yeah. yeah also, my right. daughter has been like buying all the Y2K brands lately. So <laughs> I don't, you know, like I think that's like a thing. Yeah. Like Hudson jeans and juicy couture sweat so sweatsuits and baby tees and I should have yes. kept all mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's seriously, I would pay you for like, it. She's like totally on Depop. You know, there's always that teen tween, you know, young adult customer that's like on Depop, like trends. just recycling old stuff. And so there's always that too in the trends. Yeah. yeah. People on TikTok, the tweens and the like young teenagers, the ones on TikTok like, that are literally making the trends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are. And I feel like the world is getting more creative too, which is kind of one nice thing I think about the internet um, is that, you know, it might be something different for your generation, but I feel like we have more choice in terms of what trends we're following. We're not just all looking at the same Sears catalog. Um, you know, there's more options out there. So that's cool too. Well, is there anything that you guys would like to close with? Where can people follow you online? You know, if you want to mention anything else about your course, brand plus brand, Feel free to do that as well. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having us both on. It's been so fun to chat. Um, but you can find me. My website is jennarini.com. And my Instagram is the same, jennarini. And my YouTube is jennarini channel. Um, keeping it very straightforward and simple. And our course that Julie and I teach together. And then this year, we also brought on Joss, who is a surface pattern designer. And she's been an in-house print designer at some really big brands and worked with some awesome on, on some really amazing collabs. She's teaching the module on surface pattern design, a few lessons in there. So our course opens for registration October 13th to 20th this year, which is 2021. 
Um, and we're always launching it every single year, once a year. And um, you can find that at generate.com forward slash brand plus brand. And then Julie. Um, you can find me on Instagram. It, uh, my handle is I am Julie Turkel. It's my name, but just I am. Um, and yeah, there's also links in my Instagram profile to get to on the wait list for the class, um, which we're really excited to relaunch again this year. And um, I do lives on my Instagram. I haven't done them in a while because I've had a lot of personal stuff going on, but I do plan to um, to resume that. And so if people have questions for me, I usually do like a poll every Tuesday or whatever day, the day before the live. And I, um, and I answer questions, you know, I, I'm going to try to do that once a week, but I would say every other week. So if you follow me on Instagram, you'll be able to see, um, a lot of past content and then future content and I have guests and so forth. So that's super fun and helpful for people who want to learn about licensing. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It was an absolute yeah. pleasure having you on. And again, so sorry about the technology no, um, <laughs> mishap, but I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and yeah, talk soon. Thank, thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.